For those of you here in person and for those of you here virtually, uh, thank you for joining this important conversation. Uh, I'm Herschel Nicholas, a professor here in Dartmouth's Rockefeller Center and the Government Department, and I'm glad to welcome you to the Bryce Acri Lecture to be delivered by Justice John Broderick, titled Changing the Conversation Around Mental Health, It's Way Past Time. This lecture honors the legacy of Bryce Acri, a member of Dartmouth's class of 2009, University of North Carolina PhD, political science professor at Ohio State University, and a husband, father, friend, and community member. This lecture is sponsored by Bryce's friends, family, and mentors, and we'll hear more about him from one such mentor, our colleague, Professor Dean Lacey, in a moment. As our speaker today, we're fortunate to have with us such an important, wise, and hopeful voice in the conversation about mental health. John Broderick is the Senior Director of External Affairs at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, was formerly Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, President of the University of New Hampshire School of Law, Founder of that law school's Warren Rudman Center, President of both the New Hampshire Bar Association and the New Hampshire Trial Lawyers Association. But what John's really here to tell us about today is his story, his family's story, and the lessons he's learned. It's a story that's close to home for so many on our campus and so many in our community. It's a difficult story, as many in our community know that such stories can be. But it's also a hopeful story, and one in which each of us can do our part to help others. So just a few housekeeping notes before Dean and John share with all of us. First, because it's harder to communicate openly with each other when we wear masks, John has prepared a video presentation so that he can share with us unmasked. His presentation is about 30 minutes, after which John will take questions and have a conversation with everyone here and those online. For those with questions, if you're in person, please feel free and encouraged to write the questions on note cards, send them in. We'll collect them after the video presentation and John will engage with them. Um, for those online, uh, please feel free to send questions to rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. And we'll, of course, take live questions um, from those of you here later. Uh, and lastly, before we get started, from both the Rockefeller Center and from Dartmouth, it's important to thank everyone involved in creating this conversation, which uh, at least I hope will be the first of many. So Bryce's friends and family, Dean Lacey, Bob Coates, and Joanne Blay, everyone participating in person or online, and especially John Broderick for talking through these difficult and important issues with us. And so at this point, I'll invite Professor Dean Lacey to share a bit more about Bryce, and then uh, John to share a bit more about the conversation we'll have today. My colleague, Professor Dean Lacey. <laughs> Well, thank you all for attending. Um, it, it means a lot, I know, just in principle, that everyone cares enough, those of you here, those of you remote, those of you back in Columbus. Last night, I searched through emails, my archives, to find the first time I had contact with Bryce. It was in July 2008, when he was interested in converting from being a French major to a government major, wanted to take a class in American political behavior. He'd been uh, working in the New Hampshire primaries and was very politically active at Dartmouth, not only as a member of student government, but also as a tour guide and uh, a political junkie, as we say, who was very invested in the political process and being a participant. Um, Bryce, after that, took three classes with me, um, including American Political Behavior, a seminar I just got out of about 20 minutes before we started. Bryce then went on to uh, apply to graduate school and went to the University of North Texas to uh, hone his methodological skills before attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he finished his PhD. He wrote his PhD on deep learning and ideological commitment. He developed a methodological expertise in textual analysis using text as data and taking politicians' speeches and converting that into ideological placements. He then developed an etch-a-sketch model of how candidates in primaries move their positions to be more like the primary voters, more extreme, but then in the general election try to moderate. Political scientists had studied this pr previously by thinking of it in terms of a spatial positioning model where you change your policy positions, and Bryce shows that rhetoric can help a candidate move their positions from more extreme to more moderate. This etch-a-sketch model is one of, I think, it's, one of, it's an important contribution to the study of American elections, and I know Bryce could have made many, many more. Um, Bryce was hired at Ohio State um, and I looked at the email that I sent him 
after he told me that, and he was a child of the Appalachians from Kentucky, and I'm from Western Virginia, and I, I sent him an email saying, I'm sure proud of you. Getting into that Appalachian rhetoric that I don't use very often, that idiom of I'm sure proud of you, Bryce. And he did really well. Um, it turns out he was in my old office at Ohio State from when I taught there. I saw him last, and the last email that I exchanged I had with him was in uh, 2018 after we ran into each other at a conference in Vienna, Austria, and spent two hours in Vienna City Hall uh, drinking beer and talking about research, and he seemed to be doing so well. It came as a shock just a year later or less that, uh, that um, he hadn't been doing so well, and I know that his loss is uh, deeply felt uh, in the Ohio State community and elsewhere in political science. Bryce was always had a smile on his face, deeply committed to his students, an intellectual, giving of himself, always willing to have a conversation with colleagues about their work more than his, uh, and the, the discipline lost uh, what I think would, Bryce would have been a superstar. And I know the loss is also felt by his wife, Lauren, and uh, son, Theodore. Um, but I'm glad that we can be here to uh, remember Bryce and to think about other things that uh, we can learn from this. Thank you. Good evening. I believe in masks, but I hate them too. Maybe that's where you are. But I want to thank the Rockefeller Center for inviting me here tonight. I didn't know Bryce Ackery, obviously. I wish I had. He spent a lot of his time at Dartmouth uh, on government and French. Those are my two majors at Holy Cross. And I'm here tonight to show a film and then hopefully to have some discussion about mental health. Uh, it's a very important topic, not because I'm here to talk about it, but because it's a very important topic. And I want to thank and acknowledge uh, Bryce's classmates who made tonight possible. And I want to acknowledge his widow, who I had the privilege of talking to for almost an hour a few weeks ago, so I know a lot more about Bryce than I might otherwise have. In any event, thank you for coming out. It's a pretty cold night here. And for anyone watching live stream, thank you uh, for being part of this. And when the film is over, hopefully we'll have an opportunity, Herschel and I, I appreciate him emceeing tonight, uh, to take questions. And maybe it'll start a larger discussion on this campus about policy and mental health. It's way past time, by the way. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be with all of you tonight. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm really honored to be with you. And I came today for a very simple reason. Uh, I need your help. That's why I'm here. I've been involved for the last four years now, speaking and traveling wherever I'm asked to try to change the conversation and the culture around mental illness, because we need to. All of you know that but we haven't done it. We haven't done it for generations. I see it now. I need your help. If I could do it by myself, I wouldn't bother anybody, but I can't. But we could, if you want to help. I'm a baby boomer, not that you ever could have guessed that. And I grew up in a world, sadly, where no one ever talked about mental illness. It just wasn't a conversation anyone felt comfortable having. And so as a kid, I never heard it discussed. And that was true for most of my adult life, by the way. It may be true for you. 
but I know more about it now. That's why I'm here today. Uh, I grew up uh, just north of Boston. Sorry about that, but someone has to grow up in Massachusetts, and it was me. I grew up in a very middle-class neighborhood. My dad was a high school science teacher. My mother wanted to be a nurse, but her family couldn't afford that. My mom worked in an office in the neighboring town. I live in a very leafy but very middle-class neighborhood. My best friend, when I was 10 years old, lived right across the street from my home. And his father was a graduate of MIT. In my childhood, in my neighborhood, MIT was rock star status. My friend's uncle, his father's brother, never went through high school. He was an inpatient at the Danvers Mental Hospital in Danvers, Massachusetts. Every adult who ever spoke at that place, every kid, including me, used to call it the nut house. We thought that was pretty funny, apparently. Nobody was embarrassed saying that. All these years later, looking back, I think we all should have been embarrassed. We all should have been ashamed. I see that now. But when I was 10 years old, I didn't understand that. And my friend's uncle would sometimes come to the yard, their home, on a Sunday, usually in the summer. And I can remember seeing him standing by the side of their garage, looking at the flowers, sometimes walking around the yard. He, he never looked at me, never spoke to me, never gestured to me. But I thought he was pretty scary. He was, after all, in the nut house. And when he would leave my neighborhood late on those Sundays, on those warm Sunday evenings, I felt safe again. I never had the courage to cross that road, by the way, when he was visiting. I figured they locked people like him up to keep us safe. And in my childhood, I didn't realize that anyone in my town could have a mental health problem. I thought that guy was somehow one-off. That's what I thought. And I felt pretty confident, even as a kid, in knowing that I'd never know anyone or see anyone the rest of my life who had a mental health problem. And I was wrong about that. It's one of the reasons with the help of Dr. Mitzitschak, I spent many waking hours in the last four years speaking wherever I'm invited. I would speak every day if I could. Some decades after that childhood I described in a different state, namely New Hampshire, in a different community, Manchester, and on a street somewhat different than the one I grew up on, mental illness crossed that road from my childhood and took up residence in my own house. My wife and I are baby boomers. We didn't know anything about mental illness, so we didn't see it. I had two sons, 11 and 13, that took up residence in my 13-year-old son. He didn't know he had a mental health problem. It makes sense when you think about it. How would you know just how you feel, how you react to other people or circumstances? But he was suffering. He just thought it was him and we didn't see it. When he graduated from the eighth grade, I recall it was on a Saturday, and he told us when he woke up that he didn't want to go to his graduation. And we thought he was just being lazy. It was nice weather, he wanted to play. We said, no, you have to go to your graduation. And so he went, but he wasn't really happy about it. My son started smoking in high school in the ninth grade kept it a secret. We didn't know that. He had friends at Trinity High School in Manchester where he went, but not as many as his younger brother, who was two years behind him. My son spent a lot of time in his room with his door closed, drawing. He was a very good artist from a very young age. Today, I would describe it as withdrawing, but I was pretty ignorant about mental illness back then. I'm not ignorant now, by the way. I'm not ignorant now. If you look at the yearbook for the year my son graduated from high school, you'll find his photograph with all the other graduates. But if you look through the yearbook at the candid shots, at the football games, the dances, you won't find him in those shots because he wasn't at those places. I see that now. He was probably home drawing or withdrawing. He'd done okay in high school, not nearly as well as I thought he should. He's really smart. 
but he did okay. But he always tested really well. And he got into a pretty good college in New York, and then off he went. And I don't know if it's the truth, or maybe it's a rumor you guys might know, but I, I hear that sometimes when kids go to college, they drink. I don't know if you've heard that. It could be true. Sadly, in my son's case, it was true. I can remember hearing his voice on some of those weekend phone calls. I could hear it in his speech. It was alarming. I didn't know he drank. I talked to him about it. He said, Dad, I don't have a drinking problem. I don't drink more than anybody else here. And over time, we'd be on that campus, and then his friends would seek us out, my wife and I, to express their concerns about his drinking. He would say, Dad, I don't know why they say that. I don't drink more than anybody else. I thought he must have, but I couldn't prove it or disprove it. My son got a college degree. Knowing what I now know, I have no idea how he did that. I'm in awe of him. And he had done okay, but not great. But he always tested well. He got into a pretty good graduate school in Boston. And then he came home. We were living in Manchester, New Hampshire, and he lived with us to start school. And when he got home, it was pretty clear to us he was drinking pretty much every day. It was pretty alarming to watch it. We'd talk to him about it. He clearly didn't want to talk about it. He'd say, Dad, I don't have a drinking problem. We really don't need to keep discussing it. It seemed obvious to us that he had a drinking problem. But we must have talked about it too much because he moved to Boston for the last six months of school. He got a master's degree. Again, knowing what I know now, I have no idea how he did that. He must have willed himself to that degree. And he got a job pretty quickly when he got out of school, which wasn't surprising. He's really smart. He's handsome. He's funny. He's one of the best read people I've ever met. He's a self-taught musician. He had so many skills. He's a great artist. But it was surprising that the first job only lasted six months. But he said it wasn't his fault. He lost the job. The next job took longer to get and lasted for less time. But he said it wasn't his fault. He lost the job. And then he came home. He was living with us, drinking pretty much every day, trying to hide it, trying to disguise it. He would get some part-time jobs, or hourly rate jobs, but they were never appropriate for someone with a master's degree. He would take graphic design classes wherever he could. He was genuinely talented. But his life wasn't going anywhere. And finally, my wife and I reached out to the alcohol experts and told them what I've told all of you here today. And they, by the way, didn't hesitate. They said, your son's an alcoholic, Judge. That's what's happening here. And you and your wife better deal with that. They suggested we go to Al-Anon classes for family members of alcoholics, and so we did that. My son thought it was ridiculous. Dad, I'm not an alcoholic. If I didn't have these feelings, Dad, I wouldn't be drinking. We'd tell that to the alcohol people, and that didn't dissuade them either. Judge, every alcoholic has a reason they drink. Your son's an alcoholic. And at the end of the day, he said to us, you're going to have a choice to make, and here it is. You can put your son out, literally out of your house. Hope he hits bottom. Remember that expression somewhere in my childhood. Hope he hits bottom and turns his life around. Or you can let him stay in your house, and he's going to die drinking in your house. And we didn't like those choices. And so we persuaded my son, who didn't have a drinking problem, according to him, to go to alcohol rehab. And then he majored in alcohol rehab. It was like the world tour of alcohol rehab. New Hampshire, Cape Cod, Connecticut, and finally he went to Florida. And we were praying that he would have some insight about his drinking. I picked him up at Logan Airport after he'd been in Florida for weeks. And as we were walking to baggage claim, he said, Dad, I had a drink on the plane on the way home. But I don't have a drinking problem. 
So it hadn't taken. And after a while, my wife and I realized that we had to make the decision they told us about. And up to this point, by the way, no doctor, no neighbor, no friend, no family member, and sadly not us, ever said, I wonder if he could have a mental health problem. And so finally, my wife and I anguished. We loved our son. It seemed like we had no choice. And so we put him out, literally out. It was the hardest thing we ever did and the worst thing we ever could have done. It might have been well intended, but it was just gasoline on a fire. He called us a couple of times from the streets during that time, asked if he could come home, and we said no. We said no. He slept some nights at the shelter in Manchester. He ate at the soup kitchen when he was eating. Some nights he slept in his car and he continued to drink. And I was on the Supreme Court at the time. I'd drive every day from Manchester to Concord, where the court is, and I'd be thinking on the way up and on the way home, and probably for much of the day, to be honest, that we had failed him somehow. His younger brother had a master's degree, had been married, was moving forward, as you would hope. My oldest son, with all of his skills, was going backwards at 100 miles an hour, and he couldn't even see it, and we couldn't stop it. And after three weeks of that agony and dreading that phone call, by the way, that no parent ever wants to receive, we brought him home. And when he came home, he was drinking just as much as when we had put him out. His behavior hadn't changed at all. And I am sure he was scared to death that we would put him out again and he knew he couldn't go out again. And so one night when he had been drinking, he assaulted me. I have no memory of it, but that's what happened. I went to the intensive care unit at the Elliott Hospital in Manchester. My master's educated, talented, funny, decent son was arraigned in a public courtroom in Manchester before a lot of press. I was on the Supreme Court at the time, so it was a story. He was issued an orange jumpsuit and sent to the Valley Street Jail. I didn't know any of that then, but my wife did. I learned later that it was all over the news at the time, here in Massachusetts. It was written about in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times. My doctors actually went on the Today Show to talk about how I was doing when I was in the ICU. Our attorney general in New Hampshire had a live press conference to talk about it. I don't know how my wife dealt with all that. I really don't. She told me later that she visited my son at the Valley Street Jail when I was in the ICU. Can't even imagine what that must have been like. She said they talked on a telephone with plexiglass between them. She said he had his orange jumpsuit on, his ankles were shackled, and he was very upset. He said, Mom, I can't believe I did that to Dad. Just tell me Dad's going to be okay. I can't forgive myself if anything happened to Dad. And in the early days, she didn't know. He said to her, Mom, they don't allow visitors here very often. I think it was twice a week. He said, on days you can't visit, Mom, I can see the corner of the cemetery from my cell. If you went to that street corner at the appointed hour that we agree on, I could at least see you, and I would know my family hadn't abandoned me. And so my wife would go there at 3 o'clock, park her car. It was late March, early April, kind of dreary. She told me later she'd get out and wave at the jail, multiple stories. She said, I didn't know what floor, what window, or whether anyone was looking back. She said, I always gave him a thumbs up sign before I left. And she said, I'd get in the car, I'd cry all the way home. I, I don't know how she did that. After about six or eight days in the ICU, I remember being wheeled down a corridor at the hospital. I felt pretty sore. I had no idea why I was in the hospital. So I asked the fellow who was pushing me. He said, Judge, I think you fell. I felt pretty sore for someone who'd fallen, but I had no memory of anything else. So I accepted it. 
After a day and a half, my wife and I were finally alone in this large hospital room. And by the way, when you visit people in the hospital, try not to say to them, I love your room. I hated my room. Just try not to say those things. But after a day and a half, my wife and I were finally alone, and she told me as best she knew what had happened, and I, I hadn't fallen. And she told me where my son was, and the two of us just cried. I'd been a judge and lawyer my entire professional life at that point, so I knew what it meant for him, for us, maybe even for his brother. I didn't understand it. If I had any understanding at all, it would have been alcohol when it's abused can take people to bad places. I literally couldn't get out of bed for two days in that room. I couldn't go home with my wife. I couldn't talk to my son. I, I don't know the dictionary definition of hopelessness, but I know what it feels like. That's exactly what it feels like. I wasn't allowed to visit my son at the Valley Street Jail when I got out of the hospital. I would have, but the court wouldn't allow it. My wife would go twice a week. She'd come home crying every time. Finally, friends who had known my son since he was little would take her place just to give her a break. I didn't see him for six months. And that was the day they took him to a basement windowless courtroom in Manchester so he could be sentenced to the state prison. I hope you don't have that day in your life. I would have bet you anything I owned or might ever do or accomplish, I could never have been my family. It was on that morning. It was still a story. There was still press covering it. My son came in that day through a side door with a bailiff at his elbow. It was great to see him. He looked great. Hadn't had a drink in six months. My wife and I stood up in the public row and he gave me a big hug. He said, Dad, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I said to him that morning, if you don't quit, your mother and I won't quit. I'm not sure I believe that, but that's what I said. He said, Dad, I won't quit. And then he was sentenced to seven and a half to 15 years in the state prison. I, I don't know how we all didn't pass out, to be honest. He'd served six months of the seven and a half at Valley Street. The court suspended four of the seven. The court said, maybe they'll parole you after three years. Not my call, said the judge. But you're definitely going away to the state prison for three years. My master's educated son. The court let us see him for a minute, and then off he went. You're not allowed to visit new inmates for 30 days. They evaluate every new inmate. What are the issues? Where should they live on the prison campus? So it was 30 days before we saw him. We met in the secure psychiatric unit of the state prison. That's not where he was housed, but that's where the meeting took place. We were told that day by the psychiatrist with my son present that he had serious depression, panic attacks, the feeling you're about to die, panic attacks and anxiety, which the psychiatrist described as off the charts. He said that's why he was drinking, Judge. He was self-medicating his mental illness. And when he said that to us in that place, I knew that we had failed him. I was, after all, a parent. I should have known something about mental illness. I thought all mental illness, by the way, was hopeless. It's far from hopeless. I know that now. I didn't know it on that morning. And so we're going to try to work with him and turn his life around. After four months, he came out on one of our visits twice a week. We visited. 20% of my day job, by the way, was hearing appeals from the very population he was now living with. I wasn't really popular at the prison. That will keep you awake at night if it's your child. He was very brave about it. After four months, he came out and hugged us that night, as he always did. He said, Dad, I feel so different. I said, what do you mean different? He said, Dad, I'm sleeping through the night. I haven't done that since I was little. I can focus, Dad. I... 
My mind's not racing on teaching. He was like that for the balance of his time there. But I, I knew we had failed him. He was paroled out for three years. I said, they won't parole you. I was Chief Justice then. I said, you deserve it, but it's just not going to look right if they favor the judge's son. They paroled him. He was so good on parole, by the way, that after a year, the parole officer said, I'm going to try to get rid of your parole years that lay ahead of you. He was very excited about that. I said, they, they won't do that because I'm the Chief Justice. But the parole board eliminated the parole. I'm grateful for them. When my son left prison, they sent a camera up that day. We were there, my wife and I. They put the lens in front of me and said, do you have anything you want to say? I said, I do, actually. My son's not a bad person who's now suddenly a good person. He's always been a good person. He's now well. And those are very different things, by the way. My son, who is drinking every day, has not had a drop of alcohol in over 15 years. I know the treatment worked. He said, Dad, I can spend the night in a liquor store. I might have a Coca-Cola, but I'm not that guy anymore, Dad. I don't have that tug anymore. So why am I bothering all of you? I didn't do anything, by the way, for a decade. I'm a baby boomer. I didn't want to talk about it. I'm the last guy to be talking about it now, but it's the most important thing I've ever done because I see it now. I got involved in a campaign on the five signs of mental illness, May 2016. I've devoted the last four years of my life to it. When I joined Dartmouth Hitchcock, they added to the campaign, how do you react when you find the five signs? I didn't know how to react, I do now. The day we launched it, we launched it in an empty house chamber in Concord. 400 state reps in New Hampshire, and they weren't in session. We were just going to announce the launch of a nonpartisan, nonpolitical public awareness campaign. I thought, who's going to come to this at 10 a.m. on a Monday? I got there that morning expecting 20 people. 425 people came. It's the most impressive room ever assembled in my four decades in New Hampshire. Three members of the Supreme Court, the Attorney General, the Catholic Bishop, the Episcopal Church, the Jewish community, members of our congressional delegation, our governor, doctors, lawyers, law enforcement, mental health people, and families. It was stunning. And the woman who started the Five Sides campaign, Barbara Van Dalen, asked this question of that room. Does anyone here this morning, she said, who's been untouched by mental illness, yourself, your family, your extended family, your friends. If you've never been touched by it, she said, raise your hand. I was new to it. I had no idea what to expect. Not one hand went up. Not one. Meaning every single person in that room had been touched. I said to her afterwards, Barbara, how's that possible? I said, John, it happens in every room where I ask the question. Just because people don't talk about mental health doesn't mean people and families aren't dealing with it. And she shared these statistics, which I want to share with you. Half of all mental illness in America begins by age 14. My own son was 13. Two thirds by age 23. Last year in our country, more than 47,000 people died by suicide. Fenway Park and then some. That's more than died in every traffic accident across our country, by the way. Every 90 minutes, plus or minus every day, including this day, some brave American veteran, he or she, will take their own life. We lose 20 veterans a day to suicide. From 2007 to 2017, the rate of suicide among people ages 10 to 24 increased 56%. Are we okay with that? More police officers died last year by suicide than every other cause in the line of duty. Since that launch, I have traveled over 85,000 miles. I've visited four states, talked to over 110,000 people, 
85,000 of whom are kids from seventh, seventh grade to 12th grade. I've hugged hundreds and hundreds of kids with wet eyes and cracking voices who confide in me, someone they don't know and will never see again, merely because they know I won't judge them or shame them or blame them. I wish you could be with me on those mornings. I wish you were standing with me, listening to those kids. It's not right how we treat mental illness. Half of the kids who talk to me, confide in me, are getting no help at all. I've hugged too many kids, by the way, who have told me they either want to kill themselves or try. I remember hugging one junior girl at a high school who was a varsity athlete. She said to me, this is the one-year anniversary today. And I thought she might say the day I made the varsity team. I said, the one-year anniversary of what? She said, of my suicide attempt. She started crying. I just hugged her. As she had her head on my shoulder crying, she said, I'm so happy I didn't succeed. I said, that makes two of us. I said, that's not who you are. You know that, right? That's what's bothering who you are. I went to a high school, my very first high school that I recall, right outside of Concord, New Hampshire. It was 9 in the morning. I spoke to 840 kids, grades 9 through 12, in the gym with the 30 or 40-foot ceiling. I was on a riser behind a fixed podium under the basketball net, and there was nobody on the floor. They were all in the bleachers. And I thought, this is not going to work. They're probably saying, whose grandfather is this guy? And why is he bothering us in our school? But I was there, I had to talk, so I did. I spoke just as I've spoken to you here. And when I finished speaking, there was dead silence. And the principal who was behind me against the wall, near the basketball net, he stepped up on the little riser. And there was no, no noise, nothing, for about three seconds. It seemed like three minutes. And I was thinking, maybe they didn't hear me, maybe they don't care what I'm saying. And then almost all at once, those 840 kids stood up and applauded for almost a minute. The principal said, I'm shocked by this. I said, you're shocked. I said, they're not applauding me, I know that. But what they are saying is, I agree with you. Thanks for talking about it. It happens almost every time I go out. I see what I never saw, I understand it now. I also understand that we're not doing what we need to do. We do not have a mental health system in this country. We have some great and talented people in mental health, but we don't have a system. Half the kids I talk to are getting help nowhere. I've had parents say to me, my son or daughter's having a problem, it's gonna be four or five months before I can see someone. If they broke their leg, they'd call 911. If you have a young child with a mental health problem, who do you call? How long do you wait? I need your help. I have hugged more kids who are suffering than I knew existed. And I'm going to end with this story because it stuck with me. I was speaking at a middle school in southern New Hampshire, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. The 6th and 7th graders were on the gym floor, seated on the floor. The 8th graders were in the bleachers. And I must have looked 10 feet tall to the kids on the floor. It seemed very odd. And I'm sure I was the oldest person I ever spoke to them. And when I finished speaking, I stood by the exit with the principal, and the kids started filing out. And some of them would go by and say, thanks for speaking. Your talk was awesome. These are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders who are saying that. They get it, by the way. And near the end of the rush out the door was a young man who was walking towards me. He extended his right hand, and I just reflexively grabbed it and held it. And he said, thanks for coming to our school this morning. I saw you're very welcome. I was happy to be here said, I, I want to tell you why I'm thanking you. I said, sure, why? He said, they tell me here at school that I'm on the spectrum myself. 
And your talk here this morning, he said to me, it changed my whole life. He said, can I give you a hug? He started hugging me, this little boy was crying. And my eyes watered too. I hadn't changed his whole life, believe me, I know that. But my guess was for the first time in his young life, he felt comfortable telling someone he didn't know, but he was sure would not make him feel badly about his challenges. He wanted to tell me about it. This campaign mattered to that little boy. Some days I feel like I may be on a fool's errand. Maybe nobody cares about it. Maybe it's just me. And then you have moments like that or the boy who waited 75 minutes after I spoke to tell me he wanted to commit suicide. And I took him to a counselor before I left the school and he hugged me for coming. You can't have those experiences and go home at night and pretend it's not a problem. I need your help. We need to learn the five basic signs of mental illness. And you'll see them on this video. We need to learn them. We need to talk about it. We need to normalize it. We need to reach out. We need to react to what we should see. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you will change and save lives. They may be lives you'll never meet or know about, but I guarantee you, based on my experience at this point, so many kids are relying on us and adults too, by the way. In any event, thanks for listening, thanks for inviting me, but mostly thanks for your help, because I really need it. I can't imagine it's easy to, to, to watch that. And I'm just wondering what stands out to you as you sort of think through your own story for not, not the first time that you'd want to, want to reiterate or underscore. I don't know. It's, uh, it's hard to watch it. I, I, um, it's better when you deliver it than when you watch it. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that that's my family. But through the grace of God and a lot of skilled people and the courage of my son, we are in a very different place. And he's very proud of what I'm doing, which makes me very proud to be doing it. But my family is not unique. I know that much. And I now realize how many young people, especially young people, are dealing with mental health problems and they don't necessarily have a voice, but I do. And I'm gonna use it as often as I can, as long as I can, as often as I'm invited. And I also believe, Herschel, that young people, I love your generation, by the way, I mean that. You're the least judgmental generation of Americans in the history of this country. And you'll talk about stuff that people like me never talked about. And that's how change will come. And so young people are willing to talk about it. We all need to be willing to listen to them. And we need to act to build a support system in our community and a mental health system in our country to help people who need that. There are tens of millions of people, one in five adolescents, one in five adults, who will have a mental health problem in their lifetime. The math on that is staggering. It's more than the number of people with cancer, diabetes, heart disease combined. 
And we have systems, thank God, for all of those problems. Why don't we have a system for mental health in America? And when will we have one? Young people need to be impatient and vocal. And I have confidence you will, by the way. But that's how it's going to change. That's the only way it's going to change. Uh, I'm just going to ask one more question and then open it up to, to, to the folks here. But it's, it struck me throughout your remarks that there are sort of two trends happening at the same time that you wouldn't think go together. One of those trends is, as you've said, we, we have a group of young people and, and a culture that's more conversant in these issues, more aware of these issues. There's less stigma attached to these issues than ever before. But at the same time, the problem is getting worse. And I find the juxtaposition of those two things striking, if not, if not perplexing. I'm not a clinician, so let me be very clear on that. But I pride myself in being a good listener. I was a trial lawyer. I used to listen to what witnesses said. And I was the judge for 15 years. I was paid to listen. And so I've been around to more schools than probably anyone in New England has. I've hugged more kids with wet eyes in the last five years than probably anyone alive. And because I became vulnerable to those kids with my family story, kids open up. They respect that, and they will be vulnerable to you. And I don't pretend to know all the causes of mental illness. There are multiple causes. Some of them are adverse childhood experiences. Some of them are brain chemistry. Some of them are DNA. But I do want to say this, and, and I think this, at least in my limited experience listening, a lot of kids today, as young as this sixth grade, or kids here at Dartmouth, they grow up in a petri dish, Herschel, that I don't remember. We have unwittingly, we, society, we have shortened childhood. My childhood was 12 years long. Today, if you get to age seven without being organized or stressed or overcompeting, I hear so many kids open to me telling me they don't think they can meet the expectations on their shoulders. They are striving to please their parents. They are frightened of failure, however they define that. That was not my childhood. I did OK in life. It's just a different culture. And by the way, their parents are more stressed uh, than my parents or that I was. So I'm not unsympathetic. And I don't want to sound righteous here. I'm the last person in the room that could be righteous. But I realize what I didn't know before because I've listened to young people who open to me. And the other night I was on a podcast with three students from Middlebury College, not a bad school to say the least. And they were all successful. They were all the kind of kids every parent would say, that's my son or daughter. They were also very courageous, Herschel. And the young man said, when I was in high school, he went to a public high school in Massachusetts in a very wealthy, high-achieving town. He said, they used to upload our grades pretty regularly onto some platform. He said, my dad would check my grades every single day. I couldn't have survived in that world. My parents used to check my grades at report card time. That wasn't his life experience. Kids are over-organized. We have over-organized childhood. Social, emotional growth is eyeball to eyeball. That's the world I'm from. It didn't hurt me. I knew all my neighbors. I could have walked through their house in the pitch dark. My family had dinner. My middle class family had dinner every night. My parents were present to me in our house, not because we had to schedule it. 
and we didn't have social media or iPhones or iPads or personal computers, and I'm not anti-tech, believe me. I have an iPhone and an iPad, but my world was eyeball to eyeball. We didn't have courses in social-emotional development. Social-emotional development was in my neighborhood, in my home, in my town. That's what's happening to a lot of kids. I know that now. In the town in which I live, just to share this and then I'll be quiet, and I, I understand that at some level because we've been through COVID, so believe me, I know that. I saw a lot of signs in yards last May announcing that they were the proud parents of the high school graduate. My parents were proud of me too, but they didn't need to put a sign up, and I would have been embarrassed if they had. One of those signs went down after two weeks, and replacing it was a sign that said, WPI, class of 2024. I didn't know their son or daughter, and I, I didn't know what to do with that information or why I should even know that. A family in my neighborhood put a sign up that said, proud parents of a kindergarten graduate, class of 2021. When I was in kindergarten, my parents were excited that I could use the seesaw and I could write my letters. I never saw myself as in a class in kindergarten. In a neighboring town, there was a huge house with three descending embankments, and they had obviously paid someone. It was beautifully done. And they came, and they cut the lawn in a certain way, and they had a big Syracuse S on the middle embankment painted with the Syracuse colors. What am I supposed to do with that information? What is that? I went to Holy Cross. If I had said to my parents after I was admitted, uh, hey, I think I'll get a can of purple paint and go out and put a big HC on our front yard, my mother would have said, don't you dare do that. More importantly, I never would have thought to do it, and my parents never would have thought to do it. I have people tell me all the time, kids, athletes, I think my parents are living vicariously through my sports. That's not me saying that. That's kids telling me that. I think we need to take our foot off the gas and allow kids to find out who they are, what they want to do, and they'll be fine. If you're at a good college or university, Dartmouth is one of the best schools in America. You didn't get here because you're not bright. <laughs> That's for sure. So most of what you need to succeed in life, you already have that. But you may not know really who you are yet or what you want to do with it. And that should be your decision, by the way. Counseled as you request. Encouraged and supported. But it shouldn't be my dream or someone else's dream. And I honestly believe, Herschel, a lot of what I'm seeing and hugging in schools is just what I've described. And I think that's a cultural issue. It's going to require some work, but I think it's also something that can be addressed. It's not going to solve every mental health issue. Trust me, I know that. But after five years, if you say, what do you think, what are you seeing? That's what I think. And that's what I'm seeing. And maybe some of the students here tonight would say that's been my experience in high school too. But we can change it. But we're going to need young people to be impatient enough and courageous enough to speak up. They talk to me, the grandfather they don't know. Maybe it's easy because they'll never see me again. But we need to start a broader discussion. I'm so committed to that being true. And I also know that we can do it if we want. I'm sorry to go on for so long, but I've been doing this for five years. It's become the most important thing I've ever done. I'm so committed to change. And if you hadn't noticed, I'm not getting any younger, Herschel. Uh, so I'm impatient 
to start that conversation. And I can't do it, but you could. You could. And we should. Before turning it over uh, to students to start, um, John, you should know that um, Sam Canonis, author of Dreamland, One of the Nation's Leading Authorities on the Opioid Epidemic, was here a few years before uh, the pandemic shut things down. And somebody asked him at the conclusion of his talk basically the same question. It was a, a TDI talk, so people were expecting an answer about sort of medicine um, and healthcare. And his response was to launch into an impassioned speech about the importance of community and social ties. He said nothing about organized medicine and nothing about healthcare. So, it might be. I think the discussions that I'm talking about are a necessary precursor to change. And I say that because if we could design a healthcare system, which we could, Herschel, people know a lot more about it than I do, but if we could do it, we would have done it already. We haven't done it yet. When I was a child, my mother used to whisper the word cancer. She used to whisper it. In my childhood, other than you, Hefner, Playboy magazine, I never heard an adult say the word breast. Seems silly, doesn't it? Now we say breast cancer. Everyone in this room, everyone watching, they know the color for breast cancer awareness. We all know the color. What's the color for mental health? Most people would say, you're kidding, it has a color. Remember AIDS? Who are those horrible people? If I touch them, will I get sick? If I breathe the same air, will I get HIV? And then Magic Johnson, 1991 said, I have HIV, and everyone thought he was telling us that he would be dying soon. He's very much alive. Just stepped down as president of the Lakers a few years ago. We need a Magic Johnson moment. There are people in this country, and you're one of them, Herschel, far more knowledgeable about policy choices than I am. But I will say this. We have 1.4 million lawyers in this country. I'm a lawyer, so I'm not anti-lawyer. But even I think that might be enough. We have 675,000 CPAs. We have 28,000 psychiatrists in a nation of 333 million people. We don't pay them what they deserve. By the way, they're one of the lowest paid rungs on the medical ladder. I didn't know that. We don't have enough nurse practitioners trained in mental health. We don't have enough counselors. We don't have enough social workers. Not because we couldn't, but we don't incentivize them. We don't have an integrated delivery system for physical health and mental health in this country. We don't reimburse psychiatrists at the same rate we reimburse neurologists. Why is that? Procedural medicine does much better than mental health medicine. That needs to change. There are so many things that need to happen. We need more research dollars on mental health. We had a cancer moonshot in this country, and we needed it, and I'm proud of that. Has anyone ever talked about a mental health moonshot in America? There are far more people with mental health problems than cancer. That's what I'm talking about. And, and, and my challenge, by the way, to the people here tonight and the people listening, this center, the Rockefeller Center, has got a national name. This school is one of the best schools in the United States. And my challenge is that the Rockefeller Center and Dartmouth College take up the challenge to start talking about mental health reform, mental health policy changes. And that may catch on nationally. You're not Dartmouth for no reason. People pay attention. And the Rockefeller Center is an ideal place to talk about policy reform. And my guess is that if that happened, most of the students on this campus would be applauding because they see what I'm talking about. 
And the people here, like Herschel, who's obviously pretty informed, could help lead that discussion. Because I'm one person. I'm not Dartmouth College. I'm not the Rockefeller Center. But it would matter. We've got some student questions here, but happy to start with any of you would like to ask. Yeah, Jason. Um. Oh, Jason, if you could wait for the microphone. I'm sorry for the folks online. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was curious if you're familiar with um, the current Chief Justice's work. I, with, I'm sorry, with the mask and the distance. Um, can you hear me now? I hear you now. OK, sorry, thank you. Uh, I was curious if you're familiar with the current um, New Hampshire Supreme Court Chief Justice's current work on with uh, substance abuse and mental health courts. Um, I don't know, she came to our, one of my policy classes in the fall and spoke about them and the work they're doing. And um, if you think that those courts are an effective policy solution to help people that were in similar situations or are in similar situations as your son Is your was. question, do I think those were effective and valuable? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, but they're not the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was on our court, one of the initiatives that I moved forward on was expanding mental health courts in New Hampshire and drug courts in New Hampshire. The problem with that, and the reason we were doing it, is because the social service agencies that would have been more adept at doing it were not being funded appropriately. They're still not, by the way. And mental health courts, particularly for the nonviolent offenders, which is whom we were aiming at, uh, it's very resource intensive. And so for the return you get on those investments, although they're really valuable to the few people who you can touch, you can never touch enough people. And the other thing I would say, although courts can be really important in the process, the courts are not the solution to the mental health crisis in this country. Uh, they can play their part and they should but they can't fix it any more than public schools can fix it. It was a story today, by the way, uh, on USA Today about mental health in this country and a recent report card that came out with some pretty alarming numbers, which didn't shock me, but they still stay below the radar. And, and the focus was public schools should be doing more. Why is it the public schools in America that should be doing more? They're doing more than almost anyone I know. But they, they can't fix the problem. So we, we need to look at mental health from the ground up. One of the things I would suggest is that we start universal screening from a young age. Not to diagnose people with problems, but to find out if they're having problems. We need to integrate primary care and mental health care in a way that we have not done before. Not because we're unlike bright people who know that's important, but we don't have a system that underwrites that. We should. It's not up to every college campus in America to have a certain number of counselors to solve every problem. And my hat's off to them for the work they do, trust me. It's a community problem, and I use community in the national sense. We need to address it nationally. We can't pinprick solutions. And as great as I think mental health courts are, substance courts are, they're just a pinprick. And they're never adequately funded, by the way. Ethan? Hey, can you just hang on for the microphone? Sorry. I know that, oh, geez, OK. <laughs> I know for the most part, the criminal justice system does a really awful job treating um, its people who are already at higher risk of having mental health issues. 
but also it sounds like fortunately your son was able to get the support and the treatment that he needed to overcome his issues. So did you observe any lessons with your son's own experience that you think you could apply to the broader criminal justice mental health problem? Well, first of all, my son was entitled to a parent who saw more and understood more. So I go back to my ground zero, which is we all need to learn more. Let me give you some statistics in our own state. And these come to me from the previous commissioner of corrections in New Hampshire. 65% of the women in the women's prison in our state of New Hampshire have a diagnosable mental health problem. And they didn't develop it the day after they arrived. About 40 or 45% of the men in the men's prison have a diagnosable mental illness. Compare those numbers to 20% of the population as a whole. The one thing I've learned is that the last place you want to go for mental health treatment is a jail or a prison. Not because they're not interested, but because they're under-resourced. And mental illness, by the way, I've heard it said before, and I think it's true, is the only illness in America that we don't treat until it reaches stage four. Why is that? What we need in the United States, in my view, are off-ramps. Off-ramps. If you go to the state prison in New Hampshire, it's about $50,000 a year to keep you there. It's penny-wise and pound-foolish. When some of those people, if they had off ramps and opportunities and recognition of their problems at a younger age, might never end up there. The largest providers, this should not make you proud, by the way, the largest providers of mental health services in the United States of America, 2022, are jails and prisons. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's not a very efficient use of resources, and a lot of lives get destroyed in the process. And one thing I've learned, by the way, from my family's experience, if you help one person with a mental health problem, you help all the people who love that person. I remember years ago when President Clinton was up here in the final week of his presidency, he made a statement in a large room, which I thought was directed to me. It obviously wasn't, but it resonated. It's true, by the way. He said, if something's not right in the lives of one of your children, I don't care how successful you are, I don't care how wealthy you are, something's not right in your life, too. That is particularly true with mental health and substance. Those two problems, substance misuse and mental health, are often co-occurring. Maybe 80% of the time they're co-occurring. And for years we've treated them as separate problems. You're either an alcoholic or a drug user, an addict, or you have a mental health problem. Oftentimes those two concepts are married. We're getting smarter about it, and the people in the field are doing a better job but they can't do it by themselves with existing resources. Another thing I'd like to suggest, physicians going through medical school, particularly those who will be involved in family practice, need to, need to know a whole lot more about mental health. About 60% of mental health meds, by the way, in this country are prescribed by family practitioners. I didn't know that either. So they're a huge component part of this process, but I'm sure they could use more training and they could all use more resources. We need to do a better job, but it won't happen just because we say it. It will only happen because you insist on it. I want to mention one statistic, Herschel, which should trouble everybody here. And it's not an attack on this state, by the way. There are some great people in New Hampshire doing this work. Trust me when I say that. I'm not blaming anyone, I'm just mentioning it. On Valentine's Day a year ago, 
2021. Now, COVID was pretty rampant, so I understand. That can explain some of it. On Valentine's Day last year, there were 51 children and adolescents being boarded, obviously against their will, by parents who rightly were concerned about their acute mental health episodes. And community hospitals, who are so important to delivery of health care everywhere, it's true here, they are not adept at handling acute mental illness, nor should they be expected to be. So what they would do is board those kids who were not free to leave, by the way. Some of them were there for hours. Some of them were there for days. Some of them were there for weeks until they could find a bed. Are we okay with that? I'm not. If we had 51 adults at risk of a massive heart attack in community hospitals that maybe wouldn't have been prepared for that, would we think it was okay to leave them in a room for days or weeks? Nobody would say that was okay. You know what we'd do? We'd get them to Dartmouth-Hitchcock. We'd get them to Mass General. Get them to Catholic Medical Center. We'd take them to places with the expertise, and hopefully they'd be able to take them. It is immoral, in my view, to have people who are minors, who cannot choose a doctor, cannot write the check, be suffering without relief. And if there's a good argument why that should be allowed, somebody should raise their hand and tell me, because there isn't. And I'm impatient for change. And as I said a few minutes ago, these young people who talk to me, who hug me, who I hug, they can't do that by themselves. But we could. We could. And it may be your child. It may be your child in 20 years that we're talking about tonight. And hopefully, if that's true, there'll be a system for them. And the shame and the stigma that keeps a lot of people in the shadows, even today, should go away. Just like it went away for cancer and AIDS. That's what I think. John, I'm, I'm going to throw one more question at you from, from uh, one of our, our students here. And then um, a colleague from the Student Wellness Center is going to share. Oh, few, that, I'm sorry. And then one of our colleagues from, from the Student Wellness Center is going to share a few resources. But the question, I think, follows from what you just said. And the question is, what's the most effective way to get people to talk about their own mental health struggles? And I think the question underscores the idea of their own. Um, you know, for the following reason, which is you point out the, the AIDS moment with Magic Johnson. That's Magic Johnson speaking of his own experience. Um, but commonly in the mental health space, folks are here speaking as, as family members. The two senators who did the most work on this, the late Pete Domenici and Paul Wellstone, a Republican and Democrat, were speaking as, as family members. Um, and I, I don't know which student asked this, but, but they seem to think it would be part of the, the goal that you're, you're advocating for is people speaking of their own struggles and sort of why, why that, that barrier might exist and First how, how to overcome it. I can say this to you. The only reason kids talk to me is not because I was a judge. They, they don't care. They talk to me because they know that I'm not going to judge them or shame them or blame them and that I made mistakes. The CEO of Starbucks a small coffee company, and Cisco Systems decided that mental health issues were important in their corporations, and so they led the change. They made themselves vulnerable. They talked about how they were feeling and doing themselves. In an academic setting, whether it's a high school or a college or a graduate school, if I held one of those positions knowing what I know now, I wouldn't pretend that the counselors, as good as they are, and thank goodness we have them, that they could do it by themselves. It's cultural. 
if I were president of a college, a principal of a high school, I would be talking about it. If I had a story to tell, I might tell it. And I would let them know there's no shame, there's no blame. It's a health issue, not a character flaw or a weakness. And I believe a lot of veterans who take their own life are taught to be resilient, independent, self-reliant. And when they can't do that, they're ashamed. In some ways, that's on all of us. In many settings, change starts at the top. And it needs to start at home, too. Parents need to talk to their kids and be willing to accept the answers they get. Not that hard, Herschel. Change will be hard, but the conversation that needs to precede the change will be awkward, but it's so essential. We can't fix it and design a system if we're still afraid to talk about it. And because of my family's journey and my mistakes, by the way, I am not the hero of my story. I get it now. And kids have been my teachers. And if we listen to them and respond to them, and we ask ourselves every day, is it OK to have 51 kids boarding in community hospitals with acute mental health problems? Are we OK with that? And if we're not OK with it, which is what I suspect, what are we willing to do about it? And when should we start doing it? And I don't mean to sound righteous. I'm the last guy here who could be righteous. But I am impatient. I am fiercely impatient for change. I don't want to read about another suicide. I don't want to read about another kid whose lives been derailed because we were afraid to talk about it, afraid to build a system. You could do that if you wanted. I hope you will take it up. Sid, if you've got a few things you wanted to share. Oh, no, John, please. No, no, let him sit there. No, please sit there. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sid uh, from the Student Wellness Center, and I'm the Wellbeing Program Coordinator there. I'm sure some of you have heard about us. Uh, we are right in Robinson Hall on the third floor. Um, and our office actually works uh, on a lot of these issues that we've spoken tonight. Um, and that touch different parts of student life. Uh, so namely, um, high levels of stress, substance use, uh, relationships, uh, how you can build well-being habits, uh, and also uh, sexual um, violence and more. Um, and so my role specifically there is uh, to bring mindfulness and uh, yoga, mind-body techniques uh, to student populations um, that can help build resilience. Uh, but also uh, you know, help those who might need some more specialized care. And then we coordinate with health services and counseling uh, to you know, get them the care that they need. Um, another exciting thing happening on campus here, and that perhaps uh, the Rockefeller Center might have more interest in also, is um, the JET Foundation partnership uh, that's happening. Uh, so the JET Foundation is a nonprofit that works in uh, mental health and suicide prevention. And Dartmouth is now a JET Foundation campus. Uh, so um, starting this year, there was a baseline uh, review done. And some of you students might have come across the Healthy Mind survey um, that happened on campus here. So that is going to then lead to having different work groups um, that get together from students, staff, and faculty uh, to plan strategically for the future on how policies can be changed for the better. Um, so I also have a few resources outside on the table there with our contact information. Uh, if some of you have any other questions for me or um, lastly, I would also like to thank the Rockefeller Center for having us here. Uh, and thank you so much for your talk. It was really inspiring. Yeah, John, can I just ask you quickly before, before we go, if there's one thing that you would suggest every student or everybody sort of here or watching could do like literally tonight, 
to sort of begin the conversation you described? What would I say? What would you suggest they do? What would I say to students? Well, one thing that, that they could do tonight after they leave here to just begin the course you've described. Yeah, here, please. No, no, please, no, don't do that. Uh, no, no, don't do that. Uh, if anyone here or listening thinks that the problems I've identified are real, I would ask you to do something about it. It could be as simple, by the way, as knowing the five basic signs of mental illness. Socializing it, normalizing it, starting a conversation about it. I would encourage any parent listening to learn the signs, to talk to their children about it. I would ask the people who are listening tonight or here tonight who are policy experts with the creds in policy to ask themselves, are we doing what we should be doing in mental health? What should be happening that isn't happening? And what are the pressure points? And how can we apply the pressure? As Yogi Berra, he was a player for the New York Yankees in my childhood. And he was always coming up with malaprops. Yogi Berra might say on this problem, if nothing changes, nothing changes. I'm sure of that. And so I would ask people, if they think there's no problem, then I obviously don't have a message for you. But I don't think most people feel that way. At one school in New England, not this school, at one school in New England, they've had seven suicides in the last eight months. I went to Holy Cross College for four years. There was no suicide on my campus. Something is changing. I want people to start to ask the tough questions, to have the awkward conversations, to learn what mental health is and what it's not, and to reach out to people. The Counseling Center, which is an amazing place, believe me, my hat's off to you, they can't do it all by themselves. They don't have all the resources they need. And even if they had more resources, they can't touch everyone on this campus who may be reluctant to step out. But I, my challenge tonight is really to start a conversation and to the policy people here, especially here because of who you are and the influence you could have so I started a discussion about how do we change our failed mental health system in this country to help not only kids on this campus and their families, but kids all across this country. And adults too, by the way. Kids aren't the only people suffering. But they're the only people suffering who seem to have no power and no exit. That's what I would say. Speak up and start to create conversations both personally and professionally in a policy way that will start people to listen and to change. I can't do that myself, but there are a lot of people who could. And Dartmouth is really a phenomenal school. And this place, the Rockefeller Center, is, is extraordinary in my mind. So that's my message. Speak up and act up. Make change happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.